Ramsey Campbell, what makes the story distinctively James Young? Well, here's the thing, you see. Um, I mean, I grew up with us from a very, very early age. I, I was I, hideously precocious. So I, I read 50 Years of Ghost of Us when I was like six, seven years old. And what, what I picked up on, on was not at all the antiquarian element. Um, it was the fact that he applied extraordinary skill uh, to being as striking as possible. I mean, clearly there are writers before him who had done this sort of thing. I mean, the upper berth is, a, is, a, is a, a crucial element in the development of the ghost story that ends, or not ends, but that um, comes to a head in, in James's work. But to me, what makes James is not the antiquarian background, although obviously that's important. It, it's the things that invade it. Um, it's, it's this constant sense of sometimes, um, I mean, it's not always antiquarian after all, I mean, it's something like casting the runes, admittedly, does, does have, you know, um, literary folk in it, uh, um, and, and a you know, society that discusses um, philosophical and literary themes. But at the same time, it's mainly about a, a, a pretty ordinary chap in terms of the the sort of, the, you know, in terms of the probable readership of the story, um, whose life is invaded by particularly hideous things. If you put your hand under a pillow, there's a mouth. If you look at an ad inside the, uh, the omnibus, uh, the, there's your fate written up there. Um, it's very much the ordinary um, becoming extraordinarily menacing. At times it seems to me to take on pretty well a surreal quality. <coughs> that these things can turn up anywhere in the most unlikely places. You, you open the drawer of a, a dressing table and a little hand creeps out to meet you, this sort of thing. Uh, hands, um, although decorously wearing the sleeve of a suit, may poke out of a, a hole in the ground to, to grasp your ankle. And, and it's this sense to me it, of, of the, the invasion of the ordinary by the absolutely alien, not simply the spectral necessarily, because some of these things are not the returning dead at all. Um, that the, for me is James and I think ultimately it is, it's the sense that he could do more in a glancing phrase than most writers, including certainly me and you know, our contemporaries, can do in a, where we struggle to do in a paragraph. I mean, the effect, I mean not to spoil, spoil the stories for those who have not read them, but I suspect every single person in this audience has read them. So you know, if I simply say, of crumpled linen, or and put its arms around my neck, you know exactly what story I'm talking about. How many writers of any kind can you identify from a single phrase in the story? I would suggest not very many. So for me, that's the epitome of James. Reggie Oliver, what makes a story distinctively James in? Yeah, well, if I could start in a sort of oblique way, I think one of the events which influenced James, but very indirectly, was the founding correct me if I'm wrong, in 1870, of the Psychical Research Society by F.W. Myers. In other words, this was an age, the late Victorian age, was the first age when psychic phenomena were being studied objectively, as opposed to being either part of folklore and superstition or part of religion. And I think this is uh, <clears throat> one of the elements which you find in James. He was uh, influenced, of course, uh, by J. Sheridan of Fanu, who wrote the first <coughs> psychological ghost stories, in particular one called Green Tea. The psychological element is somewhat clumsily expressed, but it's, it's, it's the first, as it were, modern ghost story. Uh, and he was, in other words, he was interested in the person being frightened as, as well as the thing that was frightening. And this this produced this uh, so-called antiquarianism. All that was was M. R. James, because he was a scholar, was skilled in producing apparently authentic ancient documents, ancient legends, ancient histories. He um, <clears throat> begins one of the treasure of Abbot Thomas with a passage that long in Latin. Um, He's one of those writers, I think all writers to a certain extent, who has the strengths of his limitations, uh, which is that he is totally unromantic. J. Sheridan Levet Fanu wrote these modern ghost stories, but he also wrote uh, old-fashioned romantic ghost stories, in other words, involving bargains with the devil, um, folklore, and uh, Carmilla, the famous vampire story, involving... Um, 
women being sort of uh, <clears throat> beleaguered by fanged creatures and so on. And that persists, but uh, uh, James rejects that totally. He's not interested in what he calls sex. There is no romance at all in his stories. There's a sort of bit of romance at the end of the tractate, mid of, but he dismisses it um, characteristically. So it's the, the exception, if you like, that proves the rule. What he is concentrates on is lonely, ordinary, isolated people. And also on ordinary places. If you look at the beginning of um, the uh, uh, a Warning to the Curious, one of his famous, most famous ghost stories, there is a description of a place called Seabra, which is Alborough, very near where I live. And you can recognize it, the description of it, um, even, even now. Uh, and it, it reads almost like a, a rather banal tour guide of East Anglia. He introduces a tiny element of atmosphere about the bleakness of the, the moorland at the top of the, uh, the ridge, but um, only a very slight hint. Um, so he is the first, um, the first of many ghost story writers um, of, the, of the 20th century who introduces the sinister into the ordinary and the banal. There are no sort of castles or mouldering ruins. Well, there are ruins, but they're not um, obviously sinister. He doesn't introduce thunder and lightning, um, sinister old noblemen, except those who have been long dead. And <clears throat> he finds the sinister and the banal, which and, and ordinary and everyday. And his events happen to ev everyday people. Um, he uses inaccurate narrators, often sort of uh, accounts from people not, who were not necessarily particularly literate. And again, all these things are to induce fear through authenticity. He also uses a method which um, I think anyone who's a Roman Catholic among you will have to forgive me, which I will call the withdrawal method. Um, in his writing. And if, if I may give a tiny uh, example um, from the, the most famous story, A Whistle, and I'll come to you, my lad. This is from the absolute climax, um, hence the withdrawal method, from, from, the, um, from the story. Um, <clears throat> what Parkins saw was an intensely horrible face of crumpled linen the sight of which went near to maddening him. Now, that is not what M. R. James wrote. What, in fact, he, 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 he writes at the very climax of this story, the, the very pinnacle of terror, is it's prefaced in a, by an ordinary piece of narration. In a very few moments, it seemed to know that the bed was empty, and then moving forward into the area of light facing the window, it showed for the first time what manner of thing it was. Then he writes, instead of what I, I wrote, Parkins, who very much dislikes being questioned about it, did once describe something of it in my hearing, and I gathered that what he chiefly remembers about it is a horrible and intensely horrible face of crumpled linen. What expression he read upon it, he would not or could not tell but the fear of it went nigh to maddening him is certain. Right at the very climax, he draws back and, and um, recounts that the climax of the whole thing, at, 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 not at second hand, but at, at third hand. Um, now, that's a very odd thing, and I have my own ideas and explanations of it, but I think I'll leave that till, till later on and hope that others will, will suggest why he does. He does this time and time again in the stories. I can quote other examples. This withdrawing, this sudden drawing back at the very moment of, of climactic horror. And he goes a little further than the energy. In fact, there's a line to the effect that, you know, as the reader will have guessed, it yes. helps the writer just in time. Yes. It doesn't help the writer just in time. It, the, the, the first part is right, isn't it? Yes, that's it. He yeah. addresses the reader directly and sort of says, well, we, we, you know, we know what's going to happen now, what is, is, has just happened, so we don't need, no need to, to linger over it. Mm. 
Right. Um, Joel Lane, what, what makes the story of Jamesian for you? I think for me, the most important thing that defines a Jamesian story is that it should be written by M.R. James. I don't think it's really possible for any other writer to, um, to achieve the effects that James achieved um, because there is actually a very idiosyncratic balance of elements in his stories. And there are lots of things that shouldn't work but do because of the um, particular talent that he had. The M.R. James type of ghost story has a very deliberate formal structure. It's, a, it's, 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 it's written in what I would call the gentle reader style, the fireside story. You know, make yourself comfortable, here we are, um, and this is a ghost story, and let's relax, and <clears throat> here are a few jokes, and a few comic characters just to get you warmed up, and now the tension is creeping in. And um, I suspect that the, um, the distancing technique that Reg is talking about is part of the way in which he, he actually signals to the reader, let's just take this seriously for a moment. You know, are you listening? Um, the, the stories were, after all, written to be read aloud. What, what the stories are about is something involving an, an exploration of the past, or something that has been buried or hidden. Um, and the foreground characters rarely matter. Um, he's not that good at characterization. Um, and, and, and it's, not, it's not important for him. Um, there might be some features of those characters that matter. You have to work that out for yourself. Um, but it's all leading up to some kind of visitation or vision. Um, and at that point, the point of the introduction of the, the point of entry of the supernatural, that is the first time in which some real emotional and symbolic meaning comes across. And um, at that point, the whole thing turns upside down, and you're actually left quite shaken. And um, I, think, I think this is extraordinarily difficult to do, and um, I don't think people who have tried to write that kind of story after James have, either they've done it in their own way, or if they've tried to do it in James' way, James' way, it's been a bit of a disaster. I would say that the, you know, the, the writers of post Jamesian antiquarian ghost stories give you a whole closet full of linen but no face in it. Um, and um, there are features of James which, are, which in themselves are quite frustrating. Um, I don't think he's as, as capable um, a writer of general prose and general storytelling as, say, uh, Delamere or Aikman, but he is better than either of them at um, capturing the supernatural moment. And along the way, you've got pages and pages of sort of sub Dickens comic dialogue. Um, you've got contrived scenarios, characters so wooden you could carve chairs from them. Um, but it's all really just sort of paving the way for these uh, extraordinary revelations. And um, I found it very interesting that, um, as Ramsey says, there are certain Jamesian quotes which are instantly recognisable, and you know which story they came from. But they are only one type of quote. They're not his introductions, they're not his characters, they're not his dialogue, they're only the one thing. Um, and that tells you a lot about his method. Right, well, as, as chairman, I was planning to um, now suggest we discuss A.N.L. Mundy, E.G. Swain, and R.H. Malden. Um, but I think that... Um, Joel has just dismissed those quite nicely. Do you think that they are anything other than fan fiction? Well, they're, they're literate fan fiction. I mean, they're, 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 they're good imitations, but I wouldn't have thought they were significant in themselves. And you know, and the, I, th I think that the 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 single greatest James story that is in some way like James is uh, Thurnley Abbey, the Percival Landon story. Um, 